Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Briar Aziz. I'm the Community Engagement Curator here at the New Orleans Museum of Art. I have the pleasure today of uh, having a conversation with Atiana Cordova, who is the founder of Water Block and Water Block Kids. Uh, Water Block is an urban design and creative studio that works to advance racial and environmental justice in our built environment through design, community engagement, and planning. Um, this conversation is in celebration of Earth Day. Um, 2021. And this is a part of the Creative Assembly uh, initiative here at NOMA. Creative Assembly is a community engagement initiative that we seek to work with community partners, artists, um, creatives, organizations to go beyond the museum's walls. And so to have a conversation with someone like Atiana today and thinking about the impact of the built environment um, is something very special. So thank you all for being a part of this conversation. So, how did you find yourself? in this work at the intersection of art, architecture, community, and social justice? Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Nick. I appreciate being invited to the conversation. Um, so the reason why my work came to be, I always tell people it's due to my life experience, being a Black woman from New Orleans, but also just personal interest. So uh, when I was younger, I always had an interest in visual art and dance and literally anything creative. And then in 2005, after Hurricane Katrina, when I came back to the city, I just saw a lot of things changing, to say the least. And when I saw those changes happening in different neighborhoods and in different areas, like, well, maybe not like many kids, but for myself, I had a lot of questions. So when I went back to school, I remember trying to dive into these different questions, like why were certain neighborhoods changing and specifically the Black neighborhoods changing? Why were Black residents not able to come back as fast as um, white residents in comparison, and what was the reasoning behind all these different factors. So as I started to dive into those different questions, um, at the time I was in an art thesis program at my school, and by the time you graduated 12th grade, you had to complete some type of project that you completed or worked on those past four years in high school. So when I was thinking about what I wanted my thesis to focus on, I thought about yet again these questions that I had about post-Katrina New Orleans and the post-Katrina landscape. And in the midst of all that, I got introduced to architecture. And architecture kind of just opened the frame and the door for all of these different pieces that I was dealing with and trying to understand, just, just brought it all together. And understanding that the decisions that we were making in our built environment in regards to our neighborhoods and in our communities after Katrina had a lot to do with design decisions that were being made, deciding who was able to come back, who wasn't, a lot of plans that were being created that was literally writing off certain neighborhoods and certain communities. And design had a large role in this conversation. So that's really how all these different interests that I had intersected. And then with the social justice lens, just looking at who's represented within architecture and design, that's a whole nother part of the conversation that we'll probably get to later in itself. So really it was my life experience led me to this work, being interested in visual art and dance and the creative process, but then also being introduced to architecture while I was in high school and having complete this thesis project and trying to find my people, my voice, and the reason why these injustices in the city were happening after the storm. So it's kind of a mixed bag of, of things that brought me to this. No, oh, cool. No, I, I completely hear that and feel that. Um, so I'm, I, I think about, you know, I've, I've, I've kept up with your work for, for years and, I, and I've read different things that you've written about your work and you often reference um, traditional design and how it perpetuates the dehumanization and killing of black people. And so I'm thinking about that from a museum context and obviously museums are structures which have been um, very racist and exclusionary. And um, that is a microcosm for a lot in this country. And despite the fact that a lot of these structures, a lot of these buildings have been built often by black people, people of color, whether we're talking about um, something at a macro level of the White House or whether we're talking about buildings that we exist um, and go to within every day um, here, you know, in the, in the city. And so I'm just curious how you uh, think these types of spaces, particularly in a city like New Orleans, where, you know, that kind of um, Southern history that that controversial racist southern history exists so much within within our buildings within our land within our environment how can we um collectively revolutionize the ways that these types of spaces engage with um black and brown communities to, to promote health and to, to promote wellness yeah so, so that's an interesting question too because when we think about traditional design practice um, so when I say that phrase in my writings, I'm also talking about the design practice that has historically excluded black and brown people 
from design conversations. And when I say design conversations, I mean the decisions and conversations are being, are, that are being had about what's happening in our built environment. And when I say built environment, I mean our cities and our neighborhoods. So these areas that we're all impacted by. So when I think about traditional design practice, I often think about the term erasure. And like you mentioned, there's so many buildings, so many spaces that Black people specifically have contributed to, but you would never see that type of acknowledgement in those areas. So if you were to walk up to you know, a building or a space here in the city that was built by enslaved labor or you know, another source of labor that was unjust, it's very rare that you see the historical acknowledgement of that, that wrong and the people that actually contributed to that space. And I think that is a large part of the traditional design practice conversation also. Oftentimes when we talk about how communities are being, being designed or the decisions made inside of communities, the people at the table don't look like the communities in which they're making decisions about. So that's another form of erasure in that sense when we talk about the built environment is that the, those in charge aren't representing the communities in which they're making decisions on the behalf of. So as far as revolutionizing black and brown health though, when we talk about our communities, I think acknowledgement is a huge part of the conversation. We have to first acknowledge the wrongs that have been done, but also acknowledge that because that wrong has been done, there has to be another side of this conversation. We can't just stop there. It's not enough just to put you know, a placard up and say, hey, you know, like, we know that this was wrong back in the day. We, we used this enslaved labor X, Y, and Z, but we have to go beyond that. But it first starts with the acknowledgement factor. So because it's so layered and what we're talking about, there's so many different factors at play. When we start to talk about what does black health start to look like in our communities, that's a hard question to answer just because we haven't seen it yet. And we haven't seen it in a grand scale where, you know, what works in this one black community as far as promoting black health and we're working in this other community across the country. I think that's something that we're still trying to decipher through and understand what does what does that look like and that's why having reimagining sessions and just having the right players at the table to actually push these conversations forward is so important because we're not there yet and the answer is still being developed oh totally me no thank thank you for that <laughs> um i mean one thing that stuck out you know in that answer was just you know this reference of erasure and, and not having people uh, enough black people, enough you know, diverse voices at the table, and so that makes me think. We're, if you're thinking from a historical standpoint about um, Claiborne, you know, at Claiborne Avenue here in New Orleans, and how you know I've I've heard, and I'm sure as you've heard, you know, how um, you know this used to be a strip of just black wealth. You know, there were black businesses. It was, it was one of the wealthiest strips, you know, of blackness, you know, in in the country at one point. Until so there was a design decision that was made, you know, where I-10 was was put along, you know, just cut that neighborhood in half, you know, and, and, and really um, destructed that that economic, um, that wealth. And, you know, this at this point, apparently, you know, it was um, between putting the I-10 where it currently is up Claiborne Avenue versus putting it somewhere near the French Quarter. I don't know if it was going to be on the outside or through, but um, that's obviously a design decision that had very detrimental economic implications for um, black and brown communities. And so how do you think um, collectively, whether we are you know, working in design or whether we're outside design, whether we're in art or government or education, how do you think we can collectively shift some of these paradigms? Yeah, so when we think about I-10, so I-10 often gets isolated as like, well, when we talk about it in the New Orleans context, it gets isolated as if like that only happened here. So I just want to make it plain, you know, in a statement that that happened all across the country to Black neighborhoods. These, you know, the highway interstates that disrupted the social and economic fabric of those communities. But when we start to think too about like collectively, how do we shift these types of paradigms? I think it starts with knowledge, honestly, because when you talk about that being a design decision, while yes, it was an urban planning design decision, so many people don't even know what urban planning is. And specifically talking about within black communities, a lot of us don't even haven't ever been exposed to what an urban planner is or what do they do or what type of power they have over our communities and our neighborhoods. So I think it first starts collectively understanding that we all should understand what design is. And that's why I like doing conversations like these within Water Black, but also with Water Black Kids is because we get to talk about what these different elements are that are impacting our neighborhoods and our cities. Because regardless if you wanna be a designer, you know, if that's something that you wanna choose career-wise, we're all impacted by these decisions in some way. So I think the first collective action really starts with understanding and knowing. 
the people and the, the, the players at play and then looking at what's been done wrong by those people and players and then either shifting them out of the conversation or doing what we have to do as a community to completely free change and reimagine what those decisions and who those players look like for the future. No, oh, thank you, thank you. Um, and so I think even related to that, you know, thinking about just the, um, the economics that, that come in, into play in, in, in architecture, urban design, the built environment, you know, again, I think, you know, about this from an art standpoint and, and the economics, the, the contrast of how, you know, the majority of museums collections still to this day, um, the works that are within these collections are majority white male artists. And, you know, the, the, the fraction of the black artists represented in, in most collections is very small. You know, sometimes we're talking about maybe two to, to 5% max. Um, so in thinking about your work, um, in that kind of same lane, how how does how do you see economics and, and wealth building for for Black people, uh, Black and Brown people, um, specifically showing up in the work that you're engaging in? Yeah, so this is when I told you before. This is one of those questions where it kind of stuck just stuck out to me the most, just because this we're talking about long term. So when we talk about wealth building, I think generationally, like how does that start to look from one generation to the next within Black communities? And with this, it's difficult to to pinpoint one exact answer, like, ah, oh, this is what we need to do. This is what needs to happen, simply because there's been so much harm done. And when I say there's been so much harm done, I always think about redlining um, in particular. So redlining being that policy that the U.S. government basically made it legal to racially segregate American neighborhoods. And by doing so, banks were able to basically deny loans to certain communities. And as expected, those communities were Black communities. So as we know, land ownership and um, having access to loans is some of the, the highest forms of gaining generational wealth and passing on that wealth to future generations. So when you completely deny and strip access to certain groups of people for so long, for decades, and make it legal to actually do so, you put them at a further step back than the rest of the country, which is typically white communities. So thinking about like wealth building going forth, the only way I see it honestly happen, happening in a, in a rapid way anyways, is to pay people what you owe them. <laughs> like so much harm has been done to black people and we always kind of dance around this reparations conversation or how can, you know, hashtag equity, hashtag justice, like what are some other ways we can kind of put band-aids over the womb? But honestly, the money is where the wealth is in a lot of ways and land ownership. Like how do we give black people back that that in which they're entitled to and what they've been stripped away from. And that's why too, I think these questions are great how they're, they're staggered and the points we're talking about is because that goes back to also, we have to first acknowledge the wrong that has been done. And largely across the US, we haven't acknowledged the harm that has been done to black people in our built environment, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our cities. And we can't ever talk about a solution without fully acknowledging what that, that actual harm is. So that's, I think, the gap that's missing. And that's why it's hard sometimes to answer these types of questions because it's so loaded. And yeah. until we have people who are really willing to step up and say, hey, okay, first, we know that thing happened. It was wrong. We know that because of that, X, Y, and Z, there's, you know, these other factors that happen. Now let's talk about what can we do to rectify this? So I think until we get to that point, it's kind of like, you know, we can talk all day about what small actions we can do and small actions do add up but at the same time it's a larger conversation around racial you know racial justice the, the economic justice out of this conversation and they're all tied together when we're talking about what this what does this future look like no totally totally um you know what's what stuck out with with that you know i'm thinking about you know you mentioned um access and and you know, access equity, like these are terms that we, we're clearly hearing a lot about now. And, but particularly, you know, you referencing this idea of acknowledgement being the first step. And so, you know, in thinking about the museum context, um, I'd be remiss, you know, if I didn't acknowledge, you know, Dismantle Noma, which was a, which was a, for those who were unaware who are watching, um, a campaign that was started last uh, summer, last June, that was an open letter from several former um, employees at, at NOMA citing the institution for its racist and exclusionary foundations. And NOMA is an example of, you know, museums across the country. You know, the, the, the art industry, the museum field, the museum environment is one that has been built upon 
colonial and exclusionary ideals. And so I think, you know, I, I applaud, you know, former colleagues for acknowledging that, uh, that, that history in the way that they did and really a charge to action for, for NOMA to become a more um, accessible, a more equitable environment for, for all people. Um, and so that, you know, I think about, you know, I often come back to the fact of, you know, like acknowledging the history of NOMA, thinking about, you know, this is a, is a, is a museum that has been around, um, it was founded in 1911, you know, uh, existing as a museum in the city of New Orleans on former plantation land. And for a hundred and what, 106 years of that history in front of that exclusionary museum on former plantation land, existed a Confederate monument. And I think just the, the layers to that, you know, like the layers to that, that, that design, that structure, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, in the, the visible and the invisible elements to um, that exclusion and in that, in that history. So I think, you know, to your point, acknowledging that is a big part um, of, of the path forward. And so um, just, I'm curious as to how you feel like your work with Water Block um, touches on that, whether we're talking about museums, whether we're talking about um, government buildings, whether we're talking about schools, like, like how you think your work kind of touches on, on those kind of layers of, of history um, and exclusion, um, visible and invisible, you know? Yeah. So once again, it's another just good question, just because, so when we say Waterblock is an urban design and creative studio that works to advance racial and environmental justice, that means we're thinking about this work one holistically. So we're thinking about when we talk about the harms that have been done in our built environment, it's not just by designers, it's also by those who have upheld this idea that black bodies are disposable. They have upheld these ideas that, you know, these exclusionary concepts of who's invited to the conversation about what's happening in our cities and neighborhoods and who's not. We've, we're talking about just all the injustices you could think about, we're thinking about it from that, that entire lens and how that impacts people at the end of the day. So with our work, we're really work, working and focusing on how do we start to dismantle all of that? Like how do we dismantle this idea of upholding whiteness and all that it represents? Because that's at the end of the day, that's what it is. So it's like, how do we not necessarily rectify the just because that's gonna take a longer amount of time to do, but just how do we start to dismantle it in the work that we're doing specifically within community? And that's and that's how we approach it with our work. Uh, thank you. Um, and so again, in thinking about the work that you're doing and access and who's at the table, um, I learned from, from keeping up with your work, uh, you referenced in a piece that uh, point, if I'm getting correct, 0.4% of architects in the country are black women. Mm -hmm. And so um, with that fact, um, can you let us know like what you're doing, but also I think, you know, even more importantly, what nationally is happening um, to to curb that uh, that that fact that 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 number as it is now. Yeah. So thank you too for highlighting that stat because when people hear it, they're like, "Wait, what? Did you say forty? Did you say 0.4? So yes, I'm just going to echo it again just so people can hear it. So as you shared, there's literally 0.4 percent of Black women that represent licensed architects across the country. So I wanna just let that sit for a while because when we think about all the aspects of our built environment, and when I say built environment, I mean the parts of our environment that are made by humans. So we're talking about the buildings, including schools, our homes, we're talking about streets, we're talking about parks, like anything you could think about within our communities and neighborhoods that have been built by people, designers have some, some play in that, those conversations. And we talk specifically about architecture, 0.4% represent black women. So I just wanna let that sit because it's really just astounding to hear that number in context because it kind of gives some more information to why we're still dealing with these things in the way that we do and why representation is also so important. But from a national stance, um, so I'm on the board for the National Organization of Minority Architects, also known as NOMA, not y'all's NOMA, but a different NOMA. And really what the charge and plight is to highlight the voice of diverse architects and designers within the built environment. So not just looking at those who have long had a hand in saying what's happening in our cities and neighborhoods, but elevating those other voices who should be a part of the conversation and really making sure that other people have access to understanding what these different profession options are. 
So that's one way in which we're just building awareness about what an architect is for those who may not understand or know it. And then also just connecting with other designers who also believe in this idea that design shouldn't be exclusionary. It should include the communities in which we're serving and it should be a conversation that's happening between us as professionals, but also with community members about how they want their neighborhoods and cities to look. So that's one way in which the conversation is being elevated and how we're working to change those stats. But then also um, I have another part of my work, which is called Water Block Kids. And with that company, we work to teach six to 12 year olds about design. And when we say design, that includes architecture, landscape architecture, urban planning and real estate through a social justice lens. So once again, talking about access, how do we start to think differently about how we're teaching the next generation of designers and the next people who will be representing our communities and our cities? And that starts with them understanding and knowing what's happening and who has a, a play in those decisions that's happening within their communities. So we really work with elementary school kids to help them think differently about the future of our cities. And with that work, we lead with the question, how can kids design a better world? And with that, it's really focusing on the idea that we may not have all the answers to that question as of yet, but by working with kids and having them to think critically about these conditions within their cities and neighborhoods, we can envision a more just future. So um, to, to kind of conclude, um, you know, thank you, thank you again for just just your time and, and sharing all that you have. Um, just yeah, I think to conclude, just can you tell us um, what you have coming up that we can keep up with? Um, also, for those who are viewing, you know, Atiana will be um, uh, working with us for an exhibition uh, this fall. Um, so we encourage uh, everyone to keep up with that, but um, in the interim, you know, please tell us how we can keep up with your work, uh, whether it's social media, what, what you know, projects you have coming up, um, yeah. Yeah, so still talking about Water Black Kids. So we have our virtual summer camp that will be launching again this summer. Um, we did it the first time last year, so we're bringing it back again, just because with COVID, we're not sure how the in-person um, element's gonna work as of yet, but we will have that virtual camp and it will be open to kids across the US and kids in the age range of six to 12 year old, years old. So if you have a child or if you know of students who may be interested in being part of the program, you can check out our website at waterblockkids.com. And then we're also on social media under the same name, so Water Black Kids. And then if you're interested in the Urban Design Studio and the work we're doing there, you can check out waterblockglobal.com. And then on Instagram, it's waterblockglobal as well. Oh. Well, um, yeah, I think um, I, I want to again just thank you for your time. Thank you for your work. Um, I look forward to continuing this dialogue, continue to work with you as a part of this Creative Assembly um, program. Um, again, uh, please, if you're viewing, um, check out Atiana's work. Look out for future collaborations uh, that we'll be doing as a part of NOMA and some fall exhibitions. Um, and yeah, um, we will see you all next time. And thank you once again, Nick, for having me. Of course.